Hey there, everybody. Welcome back. Let's do some, uh, well, I don't want to say we're going to do some calculus because we're not doing some calculus. Uh, we're doing some last minute refresher on some trig uh, just to make sure that you remember it. So 1.7 is on inverse trig functions. And 1.8, when we get to that in the next hour, is on exponential functions and logarithmic. So the, we'll start off with just like inverse sine. Uh, recall that we write it like this. Does not mean, it does not mean one over sine x, despite every other instance of negative one up top means a reciprocal. Does not mean that. Uh, if theta equals sine inverse x, this is the same as saying as sine theta equals x. For sine, I recall, sine does some shit like this. If we graphed it out with one up here, negative one down here, uh, and these are at, the zeros are at high increments. For a function to have an inverse, it has to be one-to-one. -one. So, we restrict the domain now, and this is the reason I'm showing it. If you don't remember, you can always figure it out. We restrict the domain so that we get a full, the full negative one-to-one -one without any repetition. And we try to do it as close to zero as possible. So if we want to get all the positive numbers up to one, we go up to here. And if we want to get all the negative numbers, we go down to here. That happens to be at negative pi over two and pi over two. So when we use this, theta is restricted for sine. Uh, inverse x to be between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. And if we draw the graph of sine inverse, uh, our 1 and negative 1 are along here now. And we'll have pi over 2 and negative pi over 2 along the y-axis because they swap. And negative pi over 2 was with negative 1. Pi over 2 was with positive 1. And it does some shit like this. So this part, when we morph it, goes to that. So this is sine inverse x. What did we swap? The x and the y. Went the ones beyond the x and y or the, the values are swapped, the letters are not. Yeah. This is the graph of y equals sine x. This is the graph of y equals sine inverse x. It's like we swap them to get it, but... So that's sine. I'll do a quick version of cosine. Cosine does some shit like this. And if we want to get the positive and negative values closest to zero, uh, we just go forward. So we do this first half right here, stopping at pi. 
So cosine inverse x is restricted to zero is less than theta, less than or equal to pi. <laughs> And when we graph that, and so this is y equals cosine x up here. Again, the, uh, oh, I, I should do this a little differently because I don't have any negative values for y. So we got negative one and one. We're going up to pi. And it crosses here, cosine is zero is one. Oh yeah, sorry, let me zoom out. Oh, it doesn't zoom out anymore. Fantastic. And this is up here. And it does a little bit of curve and line back. You're not going to remember that how those cosine sine inverse graphs look, but hopefully you remember the other thing. There's a lot of people online, I'm not gonna let. You guys ready for more? All right, rather than wasting your time with the graphs of the other ones, we'll just talk about the two that you're gonna, other ones that show up on occasion. Tell you right now, fuck cosecant, fuck cotangent. That's just how calculus ends up being. We they show up on occasion, but not that much. Uh, but we love the shit out of tangents. So tangent inverse x. Uh, this re is restricted to negative pi over two to pi over two, like sine. And secant inverse. It is restricted to uh, zero to pi. And I'm missing the equal force about this. I think showing the secret one actually might be worth it. And to show secant, I'm going to show cosine first. So that's cosine. So secant x, everywhere there's zeros, we have asymptotes. For secant. And we're doing from zero to pi, which is just from here to here. So secant's graph looks like this. 
or secant inverses graph is just that. That covers all of the obvious values. Maybe we should say uh, the domain is actually zero in, from zero to pi over two in union with pi over two to pi. That's probably a better way. It can't be pi over two in there. But it's a weird looking graph for a secant. Yes. Yes, it does cover all the positive and negative values. Does hit what we were looking for without having repeats. Well, that's, I'm sorry, that's not secant inverse, that's secant. The blue part is secant that we're shifting. So this is secant x. Not the graph of it. The graph of it is going to look weird also. All right, uh, finding exact values of inverse functions. Hopefully, you guys learned all your trig values for the basic 0, 30, 45, 60, 90, and like the pi equivalent, pi over 6, pi over 4, pi over 3, pi over 2. So like... What is cosine inverse of square root of 3 over 2? This is the same as asking cosine of theta equals square root of 3 over 2. So what is theta? It's pi over 6 or 30 degrees. Theta ends up being pi over 6 or 30 degrees. Pi over six is a better answer uh, in calculus. But a lot of people remember the degrees first and then shift to, because you learn degrees before you learn radians. So a lot of people remember the degree value first and then you can convert to radians pretty quickly. Radians is definitely the way you want to go from here on out because like when we do all the calculus stuff with trig functions, if you're doing it in degrees, the fucking formulas are atrocious. If you're doing it with radians, they are simple. They're like almost the easiest trig function to have. At least sine of this. So let me give you guys a few more to do. Uh, take, your, take like a minute or two. Sine inverse of negative one half. Let's do tangent inverse of negative one. Cosine inverse of negative root 2 over 2. And the sine inverse of square root of 3 over 2. And let's throw in a secant, secant inverse of 2.
If you memorize the values, it's faster than the calculator. You will always beat someone with a calculator. It takes a while to type in cosine inverse of square root of three over two. Oh, there's reasons for knowing it too. We have competitions here every semester at FNL, Barnea Labs, calculus competitions. Generally, I've seen, we've seen Calc 1 students enter, but generally Calc 2 and higher students do better. But like teachers chipping money to the prize pool. Uh, I know I do, Dr. O does, uh, Mr. Redden does, a few of us do. I think Tracy does. Uh, and prizes get to be pretty good cash prizes. I'm not talking about like, you know, lane prize, like fucking money in hand. The green. Who here doesn't remember them? Be honest. It's okay to be honest. A lot of you. Okay, I will link a video in Canvas. Uh, and that you can watch. There's like, it's like maybe 10 minutes. She will show you a fucking easy way to remember all these values. Like it's super fucking easy. It uses your, I think she uses her left hand. Put your left hand down, you can do it like that. Uh, it's really easy. We'll go through them. Uh, this is saying tangent theta equals what? Or negative one, sorry. Uh, in the domain, negative pi over two to pi over two, where does that happen? Uh, these occur when we're at the 45 degree marks. Uh, but we want the negative one, so we got to go backwards. Negative so negative, well, 315 or negative 45. We don't want to go 315 because we're outside the domain tangent. We got to do negative 45, so negative 45 degrees or negative pi over 4. This one's asking cosine theta equals negative root two over two. That is at a 45 degree mark, but we're in the negative quadrant. We're that way. That's 135 degrees or three pi over four. What did you say? Just thinking. Two pi over three, yeah, that would be 120. Sine inverse of negative one half is saying when does sine theta equal negative one half? Uh, the theta, the reference angle for theta is 30 degrees or pi over six. We want the negative one and sine for negative is backwards. So we're looking at negative 30 degrees or negative pi over six. This is like doing sine of theta equals square root of three over two. That happens at 60 degrees or pi over three.
And ooh, ooh, what is this? Secret theta equals two. So this is like saying one over cosine theta equals two. And if we take the reciprocal, or you, you cross multiply, uh, we end up getting cosine theta equals one half. And that happens at 60 degrees or pi over three. Yeah. Go over uh, sine inverse of negative one half again. Yeah. Uh, so I, I'll do it pictorially. So it's easier for me to think about where the positive one is. So if I did positive one half, it's at 30 degrees for sine equaling one half. But I need the negative version, which means going backwards. Or negative pi over six. Those are called reference angles where you turn it into what's going on in the first quadrant. That's why, yeah, that's why you even heard me say uh, this one, even on this one, even though it's 135 degrees, I said that's at the 45 degree mark because I'm doing the reference angle where it would be over here. And you literally just reflected across, across the axis to look at what it's going to look like. Um, uh, unrelated to this, just uh, what, what are the hours from Mesa again? Uh, during the weekday. The weekdays, I think they're open all day. So, and by Celia, it's like 8 a.m. to what, what time? It's like a there And on Saturdays, it's I'm there from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. And I try to go on Saturday night, but I can't because I work overnight. So, uh, yeah, but if you go during the weekdays, that's good. Friday, I think they have shorter hours. I think it's 8 to 5. Because, uh, like, most people go to Friday night line after that. Which is, I think, starts next week, not this week. We always try to give a couple of weeks for the students to get back in the group of going to classes and shit. What else we got here? You know what? We got time. I'm going to load that video that I was going to tell you about. And I'll put a link to it too. Uh, let me do this. Let me reshare screen here. You're looking at, it's called uh, Calc Workshop. I look up left hand. There we go. Calc Workshop left hand. If you Google that, uh, radian measure. And you scroll down and you get to, she likes to show us pictorially how to do it. Uh, and there is a video, left hand trick worksheet. This is the video. She starts doing it at the 2351 mark. Let me make sure I'm sharing sound on the video I am. Okay. All right, so what we're gonna do right now is we're going to complete the unit circle. It's gonna be wickedly easy. And then we're going to use our powers of sine and cosine and even tangent to find all of the ordered pairs that go with our unit circle. And then we're gonna see that we can use it to be human calculators. So let's start. We're gonna complete this unit circle. Again, we have all the quadrantal angles and we've already seen how to do that. We've got zero degrees, which equates to zero radians, or 360 degrees, which is two pi. We know that 90 degrees is pi over two. We know that 180 degrees is pi, and 270 degrees is three pi over two. So, how is that helpful? What we're gonna do is we're gonna realize that our left hand, it contains everything we need to complete this circle. 
we're going to pop our left hand into the first quadrant. What you're going to see now, some people like to put their hands like this, face down on their paper. I prefer to have my palm up because you're going to see that you're going to have to bend your fingers. And it's harder to bend your fingers down this way than it is to curl them in. So I always put my hand down on the piece of paper, palm up. Notice that your pinky finger is on the x-axis and relates to the 0 or 2 pi measurement. That your thumb is upon the y-axis and relates to the pi over 2 measurement. But notice the middle, these three fingers that are inside. Guess what? They look just like your 30, 45, and 60 degree angles. So that's what they are. So now I'm going to draw my amazing hand. And again, it's going to look funky. So there's my hand. It's beautiful, isn't it? So what do we know? Our hand that's sitting in there, so here's our thumb and here's our pinky, and our fingers are relating to these special right triangles. So how do I memorize it? Well, all we're going to do is count. Two, three, four, no one likes five, six. Two, three, four, no one likes five, six. So watch. We've got pi over two, then we've got pi over three, then we have pi over four. No one likes five, just kidding. And then pi over six, zero. All we're doing is counting, and you know how to count. So two, three, four, no one likes five, six, zero. It's all in your hand, and all we're doing is counting. Two, three, four, skipping five, and going to six. So now we know exactly what the radian measures are without even having to think. All we're doing is counting. Pi over two, pi over three, pi over four, pi over six, and zero. Two, three, four, six, zero. Easy. OK, well, what else do we know? Well, we know that at all of these locations, we have coordinates, ordered pairs. If we know that the radius is going to be 1, so we know this is going to be 1, 0, and this value here is 0, 1. We also know that pi, we have negative 1, 0, one unit out in the negative x direction, and here we've got 0, negative 1. Well, what do we remember? Well, in this quadrant, we also remembered that we could find these trigonometric values. But before we actually put these ordered pairs down, let's see what they would equate to over in these quadrants. Again, what happens if we went 120 degrees or 150 degrees? Are we going to have to sit there and calculate pi over 180 every time? No. So watch. We know all students take calculus. So we know that the special right triangles are going to apply to all of these quadrants. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stick those values appropriately in each quadrant. And I'm color coding them just to help us out. So we know that if we had 60 degree right triangle, 60 degree right triangle, 60 degree right triangle, they would all match up accordingly. But how are we going to find those measurements? We don't want to sit there and have to calculate pi over 180 for any value we want. We should be able to pull this out quickly, and we are. All students take calculus. We are going to basically see that all of these values are going to have the same denominators. And all we've got to do is figure out what our numerators are. So they're all going to have the same denominators, which is very cool. That's the reference angle thing. But I wonder what the numerators are. Well, it's all sitting right here. All students take calculus. S. We know that it stands for the sine and its reciprocal cosecant. And we know that the sine is going to be positive in that quadrant. But it's also going to tell us something else. It means subtract 1. So we're going to subtract 1 from the denominator. So what is 3 minus 1? Well, that value is 2. So that means this guy is 2 pi over 3. Subtract 1. What's 4 minus 1? 3. This value is 3 pi over 4. 6. Subtract 1. 6 minus 1 
is 5. 5 pi over 6. So that S not only tells you that the sign is positive in that quadrant, but it's helping you to remember how to get the radian measures. Again, we could sit here and say, all right, 150 degrees times pi over 180, well, that's going to equal 5 pi over 6. We could. It's going to take us longer trying to figure out, OK, what number goes into both. Or we can use the fact that we know what the S is also standing for. It means subtract 1 from the denominator, and you get 5. 5 pi over 6. You don't even have to think very hard. You know how to count. And if you know how to count, you know your unit circle. So now, the second thing we're going to talk about is our third quadrant. Well, we know that in the third quadrant, both the x and the y are negative, which means the tangent function is the only one that's positive. What I'm going to do, though, is I'm going to change that t to its lower case. There's a lower case t. Huh. What else does it look like? It looks like a plus. Oh, if it looks like a plus, that's telling you something. Here, we're going to add 1 to all the denominators. Again, this was tangent, lowercase t makes a plus sign. So again, we know as all students take calculus, we know it's going to be a plus sign. We're going to add 1. Let's go ahead and do it. 6. Add 1. 6 plus 1 is 7. Guess what? 7 pi over 6. 4. Add 1. 4 plus 1 is 5. 5 pi over 4. 3. Add 1. 3 plus 1 is 4. 4 pi over 3. If you can count, you can do your unit circle. Again, we know our first quadrant. 2, 3, 4. No one likes 5. 6. Here, the S stands for signs positive, but it's also telling us subtract. Subtract 1 from the denominator, and you get your new numerators. Here, tangent, T, looks like a plus sign in lowercase. Add 1 to the denominators, and now you have our radian measures for these values. So, what about our last fourth quadrant? Well, our fourth quadrant is our primes. So, C, we don't really have a good way of adding or subtracting. We have subtract for S, and we have add for plus. C are just going to be our prime values. So what we're going to say here is that we've got 7 pi over 3, or excuse me, 5 pi over 3, forgive me, 5 pi that over 3, is prime. It's easy and then we have the bottom and 7 off. pi over 4, and 11 pi over 6. Notice 5, 7, and 11 are prime numbers. But here's, so yeah, 5, 7, 11, 7, 11, who doesn't one. want to go to 7, 11? So easy for us to memorize even in the fourth quadrant, they're just your primes. 5, 7, 11, it kind of rhymes together. And 7, 11, it's a nice place to stop off and get a nice drink. So what we see, we've got all students take calculus. We know which guy's positive in each quadrant. But it's also helping us to remember so how to get our radian measures okay. all the way around. If we can count, we can get it. So again, our hand is telling us exactly what our measures are. 2, 3, 4. No one likes 5, 6. Here, we're going to subtract one from the bottom and get our, our numerators. Here, we're going to add one from the bottom and get our numerators. Here, just our primes. So now that we've figured out and completed our unit circle, let's go ahead and add in our, our values in here to help us out. So we know that pi over 6, ready? We've got 2, 3, 4, excuse me, 2, 3, so 4, 6, values. and 0. Well, How are we going remember. to remember? that this ordered pair is the square root of 3 over 2. And how are we going to remember she meant to write one half there, not pair two is the square root of 2 over that, 2 and the square root of 3 value. over 2? And again, how are we going to remember that this guy is one half and the square root of 3 over 2? I'm pretty comfortable in figuring out which one's the rating measure. I can add, no right problem. There, I can figure this out. Half. But oh my goodness, that's a daunting task. How am I ever going to remember it? Again, everything's on your hand. So let's see what's going to happen. What we're going to see is that we know that we've got an ordered pair. We have cosine, comma, sine of theta. This comma is going to be used as the finger that you pull down. So he represents the finger you pull 
down. So if I have my left hand, if I pull down a finger, he's behaving like the comma. If I pull down this finger, that finger behaves like the comma. Again, if I pull this finger down, that behaves like the comma. Whichever finger is pulled down, treat it like the comma. So now, we can see that our fingers behave, in essence, like an ordered pair. Our finger that's pulled down behaves like the comma, and we see fingers to the right and to the left. Well, guess what? That's going to tell us exactly what's the cosine and what's the sine. What we're going to do is we're going to say that this, the cosine, the x, are the square root of the fingers on the left. So I'll go ahead and write a little bit bigger. So it's the square root of the fingers on the left all divided by 2. And here, it's the square root of the yeah. fingers no. on the right all divided by 2. So, let's play around. If I wanted to know how to get that ordered pair, I know this is pi over 6. So if we've got pi over 6, and I wanted the sine of pi over 6, well, let's use our finger. Are you ready? Pi over 2, pi over 3, pi over 4, pi over 6. So I'm going to take my fingers and I'm going to put it like this. So what I see is I've got that finger, I've got basically this finger is down, and I've got that going on. So this finger is down, pi over 6. So let's talk about what we see. We've got three fingers on the left-hand side, one finger on the right. That means we have the square root of 3 divided by 2. We have that comma, and we have the square root of 1 divided by 2. Fingers on the left, fingers on the right. Well, the square root of 3 over 2, that's, that's just as simplified as I can get. Square root of 1, well, the square root of 1 is just 1. So it's the same thing as the square root of 3 over 2 and 1. Does that make sense? And then you use symmetry across the y-axis and across the x-axis. Like, she's got all the color coded. So, and that's what the S, T, and T stand for. S is plus, it stands for sine, really. Sine's positive in this quadrant, cosine's negative. The sine is y, and above the x-axis, y is positive, and over in this quadrant, x is negative. T is for tangent. Tangents are positive. Cosine and sine are both negative. And here, cosine is positive, and tangent and sine are negative. You literally just mirror them across, use the exact same values, and change the sign to according to the quadrant. I, I have That's, a question. Okay. Yeah. That 2 shouldn't be 1 over 2? This 2 should be 1 over 2. In fact, she just wrote it right here. Oh. She made a mistake. She I don't think she ever catches it. <laughs> I watched a we, while we, on it before. But, we, like, I'll, if you want to watch right. more, she'll walk through a bunch of problems. I'll have a link to it in Canvas. There is a little more we need to do in class, though, for this topic. So I'm going to switch over. Let's see, we got to get my Zoom controls. I'll change back over to this. I'll change back over to that. Sorry. All right, so a little bit more going on uh, for trig functions. Uh, when we see them like mixed together, like let's rewrite cosine of sine inverse of x. Uh, rewrite without trig functions. So this is like saying cosine of theta. So theta equals sine inverse x. And so like sine of theta equals x. Or x over 1. Sine is opposite over hypotenuse. You got a good old Sopatoa going on. And 
since uh, we don't know if X is positive or negative, I'm just going to treat it as positive. Uh, we're looking at something like this. Angle theta. Opposite is X. Hypotenuse is 1. Which is weird calling that X because that's really our Y. But we don't know the length of it. Uh, I'll call this A. We have, using the Pythagorean formula, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. a squared plus x squared equals 1 squared. So a squared equals 1 minus x squared. And a equals plus or minus the square root of 1 minus x squared. And cosine, so we'll, we'll treat it as the positive one. So we'll just go with the positive one minus x squared. Oops. That's our a. And now we want cosine theta. Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. Adjacent to that angle is square root of one minus x squared. Hypotenuse is one. So cosine theta equals square root of one minus x squared. And that is the same thing as cosine sine inverse. Well, tricksy, isn't it? So without the visual, uh, how would you determine that? Uh, so at the last step uh, under the, the triangle, uh, A equals square root of 1 minus x squared. Uh, how would you determine whether or not you're using positive or negative without a um, without a visual at the top? I don't know how you're going to even get that formula without a visual. So you would need the visual, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's like yeah. realizing that you're going with the right triangle and where things are going and what fits in what slot. I wouldn't trust the accuracy of myself with it without having a visual. Even if I created the visual in my head and tried to hold it there, uh, I would still make a graph in my, I would picture the triangle in my head. I don't know that you're really gonna effectively do this well without a visual. Okay, uh, something else to be aware of, uh, how domains are affected by, domains affected by shit on the inside. Let's say y equals sine inverse of 2x. So this is like 2x equals sine of y, and x equals 1 half sine of y. So we should still have the domain for the main function for sine. Should still, we should be able for y. I guess it's for our argument, should still be the negative pi over 2 to pi over 2.
But what happens to the output? Where we used to go up to one, and down to negative one, the one half is shortening it. Down to negative one half and positive one half. That's for the sign. I should say negative one. So when we look at the domain of sine, domain of sine inverse of two x, the range here was negative one half to one half, and the range of one is the domain of the inverse. So the domain is now negative one half to one half, not negative one to one anymore. So you gotta play around with the graph if you got weird angles on the, like something besides X on the inside. So it kind of just like flattens it down, doesn't make the angles as steep going upwards. It, fl it flattens it down. Uh, when, well, only because it's on the outside here. When we shift it up, we rewrite re it, it's on the outside. It's called the amplitude. This affects the amplitude of the graph. So just as look like another example, I guess, uh, if that was um, uh, within like 6x, um, then we just divide by 6 then in that case? That yeah, it's going to end up being divided by 6. Okay. You would have a 1 6 out here. Because oh. you have a 6 over here, and then... Are ready for more? Wait, 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 wait. Uh, so for the range, because it's the inverse, that's why they switch the domain. Yeah, inverse, when you take the inverse of any function, the domain and range swap places. Just like when you calculate find the inverse of a function, you swap y and x, that's what we're effectively doing. Domain is x, we swap y, so now it's the range. Are you good this way? I'm done. Everyone yeah, good? No, That's good. Thank you. I don't know that everyone's done. Some people are still writing. Ah. All right, let's take a little one and uh, a look at another one. If we've got cosine of two sine inverse x. This is like saying theta equals two sine inverse x. So theta over two equals sine inverse x. And so x equals sine of theta over two. Now, if you were in here early enough, I had this up on the screen looking up half angle identities. This is called a half angle. There are half angle trig identities. You just look them up when you get weird shit like this. If I have one on a test where it shows up on a test, you will have the equation on the test. Uh, but the half angle identity for sine theta over two is plus or minus one minus cosine theta all about by two. This is all under the radical. And we're trying to find out what, what our goal here, if I put in theta, we're trying to find out what cosine theta equals. What does that equal? So we're going to solve for cosine theta. Let's square both sides. We get x squared equals 1 minus cosine theta over 2. Uh, 
Uh, multiply by two, we get two X squared equals one minus cosine theta. And I will add cosine theta and subtract two X squared from both sides. And I get cosine theta, which is cosine of two sine inverse X is one minus two X squared. Was that fun? Things get a little bit easier if we don't have a, a variable in there. So like, let's say we're doing tangent of sine inverse of negative one fourth. Big refresher in an hour. We can't hit everything, obviously, but we'll have a bunch of the weird things that you'll use. So we're going to call that our theta. So theta equals sine inverse of negative one fourth. So sine theta equals negative one fourth. That's going to be in quadrant four. And if I, with that being theta right there, and if we say this is opposite over hypotenuse, well, the hypotenuse is always going to be positive, so the negative is going to go up top. So that's a four, and that's a negative one. And if we want to figure out our x value, we can do the right triangle and use Pythagorean formula, x squared plus negative one squared equals four squared. Solve for x. But there we can see x is positive. So I'll write square root of 15 right there. So we're looking at tangent theta, which is going to be our tangent of sine inverse of negative one fourth. Tangent is TOA opposite over adjacent. Opposite is negative one. Adjacent is square root of 15. And if we rationalize the denominator, we get negative square root of 15 over 15. And when you're done writing, let's take a 10 minute break. And I'll make it a separate video. When we do 1.8, I'll hit stop, record.